Welcome to the worship service of the First Presbyterian Church of Seneca Falls, New York. We are delighted that you have joined us here today. Um, I earlier recorded this, and you may have caught a portion of the live service as we attempted again to stream online, but we lost um, the sound halfway through the First Testament reading. So um, this is the June 13th worship service 2.0. But we are going to do it um, with as much enthusiasm and energy as we did this morning as we were worshiping together. So let us say now our mission statement. Be welcoming, be compassionate, be you bravely, be community. I have just a few announcements. Today is my last Sunday before I head off on my sabbatical, but I am working throughout this week. So if you need to touch base with me before we I leave, um, I'm more than happy to. Please send me an email or call the church office or call my cell phone, and I would be delighted to get together with you and chat before I leave. Otherwise, I will, I will be returning uh, at the week after Labor Day. Let us call ourselves to worship this day. We are gathered in one place to call on the name of the Lord. Come Holy Spirit, come. We are members of one body calling out in Jesus's name. Come Holy Spirit, come. Let us now bring forth our offering as we think of ways this week to give God a portion or all of our time and our talent and our treasures as we sing this prayer of dedication. Let us now join together in our prayer of confession. Living God, we confess that we look for the living among the dead. You speak to us in every language, but we refuse to heed your word. You pour out the gifts of your spirit, but we try to contain your grace. Forgive us. Give us new life. Breathe upon us with mercy and fill us with the power to proclaim the life that death cannot destroy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. Take courage. God's spirit empowers us to move from the ways of death to the ways of new life. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and hope is renewed. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. And I ask you share the peace of Christ with everyone you meet this week and right now with anybody who may be in watching this with you.
those who are in person this morning uh, or were joining us, this is exactly where the video cut out online as we streamed today. So you get me and not Joyce reading this and doing this prayer of illumination. Um, so you'll have to catch Joyce maybe doing it sometime else this summer. Let us pray. Holy God, like a rushing wind, your spirit moved upon the first disciples. And on the day of Pentecost, like a purifying fire, your spirit seared their hearts and their minds with a message of salvation. Send your spirit upon the church in this time and in this place. Stir up our courage and rouse us from for prophetic witness that we may join with them to proclaim the world your mighty deeds of power in Jesus Christ. Amen. The reading is from Psalm 53 to the leader according to Malahalath, a mascal of David. Fools say in their hearts, there is no God. They are corrupt. They commit abominable acts. There is no good. No one who does good. God looks down from heaven on humankind to see if there are any who are wise, who seek after God. They have all fallen away. They are all alike perverse. There is no one who does good now, not one. Have they no knowledge, those evildoers, who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they shall be in great tear, in tear such as has not been seen, has not been. For God will scatter the bones of the ungodly. They will be put to shame, for God has rejected them. Oh, that deliverance for Israel would come from Zion. When God restores the fortunes of his people, Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be glad. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And from Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. At that time, Jesus went through the cornfields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain to eat. Then the Pharisees saw it, and they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath. And he said to them, Have you not read what David did when his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him or his companions to eat, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and yet are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. But if you have known what it means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. He left that place and entered the synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand and he asked him, is it lawful to cure on the Sabbath? so that they might accuse him. He said to them, suppose one of you has only one sheep and it falls in a pit on the Sabbath. You will, will you not lay hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a human being than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and it was restored as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went on, out and conspired against him on how to destroy him. The words of the Lord, thanks be to God. The chaplain residency program I was a part of at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Hospital was like any good internship. It was a life-changing experience. One of the many lessons that I learned was a way to respond when someone says to you, there is no God. We found that statement. We find it in today's psalm. Not believing that there is a God is not a modern concept. It appears it is a tale as old as time, even interwoven into the prayers of the people. My instinct is, of course, to defend the existence of God with a yes, there is. Now, this is a quick way to have a dialogue that goes absolutely nowhere. It only turns into a giant volley of, I said, you said, yes, there is a God. No, there isn't a God. Yes, there is a God. No, there isn't a God. And that only ends when someone gets tired of responding. No bridges are built. 
no relationships are strengthened, and there is zero knowledge gained. So instead, our teacher taught us to use this phrase, tell me about the God you don't believe in. Now, you might be amazed at the conversations that took place after those words were spoken, because no one was put on defensive. Bridges then were able to be built, relationships strengthened, knowledge gained. It was a way and a way to have a conversation that opened up perspectives and didn't only help the patient, but it helped me too. I believe in this passage that Jesus is showing us the wideness in God's mercy. I don't think it was designed us to designed to show us what a rebel Jesus was, though I like the image of a rebellious Jesus. But rather, I think it is done to tell us about the God that Jesus believes in. Jesus saw God differently than the world saw God. And Jesus knew God differently than the world knew God. Bill Ellis at the Marcus Borg Foundation stated that in both cases, now he's using the Mark scripture, which is identical, like very similar to the Matthew scripture, what I read from. So in both cases, Jesus shows the utmost respect for the law. Never does he suggest that the law doesn't matter. Never does he imply that his tradition is simply a tool of the oppressor class. As disappointing as that may be to some, he is not in these examples are revolutionary. On the contrary, Jesus justifies his actions in both cases, appealing to the deeper tradition that they all share. In both story, Jesus moves outside the letter in a way that is consistent with his whole tradition. And together they illustrate the principle that guides people to this day. If the purpose of the law is to teach people to live with each other in fairness and justice, compassion and mercy, then when applying the strict letter of the law, then it has to lead, uh, that leads to injustice and unnecessary hardship. It is then the duty of those who apply the law to look beyond the letter to fulfill in it its spirit. That's where the insight into human nature rises to brilliance after Jesus confounds his adversaries. It's concluded in these stories with these words, the Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against them on how to destroy. People will seek to fulfill the spirit of the law by moving beyond the letter will always be perceived then as dangerous. And most often they're gonna pay a price. And sometimes that price is very heavy. There are countless examples of people in every generation who've noticed that the letter of the law at time creates hardship and injustice and violates then the spirit of the law. And some of these people have drawn our attention to that truth by violating the letter in order to uphold the spirit. But most of the time they pay a price because most of the time these people are seen as anarchists and subversives. And indeed, once in a while, the subversive, because of what some who do this seek is not justice, but power. But those who follow the example, who see in Jesus today are not subversives. They are pointing not to themselves, but to justice and compassion and to mercy, just as Jesus does in this story. And thus, while the penalty people must pay for pointing to the spirit by moving beyond the letter is in fact the emblem of faith and a sign of God's presence in the world. Thank you, Bill Ellis, for this words. Now I'm a Presbyterian and a huge reason I'm a Presbyterian is because I'm a person who loves rules and laws and structures. I want to know the boundaries. I want it to have order and I want to know what the expectations are of me. However, I've also learned that one of our books, The Book of Order, is as generous as it is strict. It just depends on who's reading it and how we choose to view it. For instance, communion. Communion is defined that we must use a grain that is common to the area. That's what the Book of Order says. We have to use a grain that is common to the area. Now that can be bread, but the Book of Order does not say it has to be white wonder bread. Because Jesus took bread and broke it from a grain common to the area. However, one could argue that a cookie or a brownie or a piece of cake also have grain common to the area. 
see it as as strict or as generous as we choose to view it. The letter of the law and the spirit of the law is not a new modern concept either. Paul speaks about them in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 through 6, when he says, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are the letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human heart. Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are confident in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but that our confidence comes from God. God has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills and the spirit gives life. Jesus wasn't just about breaking the laws because he was a rebel. Jesus was about giving life. He was a spirit who gave life. He chose generosity and grace, compassion, justice, and mercy every time. The God that Jesus believed in and embodied was a God of grace. Here's the difference I see in the grace Jesus displays and the one most of us tend to display. He said to them, suppose one of you has only one sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath. Will you not lay hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a human being than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and it was restored as sound as the other. Jesus points out right here in this moment, how we practice the spirit of the law when it suits us or people who are like us or people we know or people who are in our family and people we love, but we don't always extend that same spirit of law, that grace to our neighbors. I am as guilty of this as the next person. I give myself a pass whenever I am tired, whenever I am hangry, but do I expend, extend that same amount of grace to my tired, hangry children? Mm-mm, not always. Do I do it to the stranger? Not ever. But Jesus did. Jesus did it every single time. Who are my brothers and sisters? He asked, who is my mother? Everyone. Everyone is a child of God. Every one of us is that one sheep that God has to lay a hold of, and take out of the pit, even if it's on the Sabbath. There is a wideness in God's mercy. The question I have to ask myself all the time is if there is a wideness in my mercy too. Do I live as a person who is a letter of the law or a spirit of the law? Do I live as a fool who lives life as if there is no God like the psalmist says? Or do I live life showing others about the God I believe in like Jesus did? Amen.
see you, Hedra. I thank you for that gift, our music director who took uh, <laughs> the words from the sermon and mm -hmm. placed them in here and kind of tweaked them to put them into the wideness in God's mercy. I see this special gift on the Sabbath and I thank you for my sabbatical blessing and thank you for it. Let us pray. Loving God, may there be a way of traveling that harms not the earth, a way of having that leaves plenty for others, a time for tears that dissolves grief, a time for kindness that heals many wounds, a season of forgiveness that ceases our gender differences, a path of peacemaking that settles strife, a journey of justice seeking that creates hope, a doorway for loving that brings rebirth. Loving God, may there be seasons of faithfulness, a promise of eternity, a way to be living a style of earth caring, a song for the singing, a moment of joyous praise, an opportunity for living with God's wisdom to heal the earth in Jesus the Christ, who taught us to say as we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you go forth from this place, may you be ambassadors of peace and grace, whether it is in a parking lot or a playground. May Jesus lead you through the doorway of another week with the good news that life is worth living. Regardless of what you do or where you are, grace abounds. So may you go forth with eyes open to see the miracles of God's world. And may that love and the peace of God sustain you and all those you love and all those we try to love, wherever they may be, as you leave this place renewed and refreshed. Amen. Mm -hmm.